So today we are delighted to welcome Professor Daniel Solomon, who is um, the Chief of the Section of Clinical Sciences and Professor of Medicine at the Brigham and Women's and Harvard Medical School at the Division of Rheumatology in the USA. And um, thank you for joining us, Professor Solomon. Um, sure. He's going to be talking to us about one of his abstracts being presented at this year's ULAR Congress. This particular one is on the osteoporosis poster tour. Um, and is on delayed denodumab injections and fracture risk among subjects with osteoporosis. Um, so to start with, um, please, could you just give us an overview of the study and the key findings from it? Sure. Uh, we studied whether delaying denosumab injections might be associated with an increased risk of fractures in general and specific types of fractures. And we used a UK uh, general practice database called THIN and found that uh, vertebral fractures were increased in their risk among patients who had severely delayed denosumab um, injections. There was a general increase in risk with delays in injections that became most dramatic at the most severe delay and specifically for vertebral fractures. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to ask you a bit more about the results um, in a second, but um, I noticed in the methodology you um, used a term that you'd um, emulated a target trial. Um, could you just please explain a bit more about what that means and why you specifically used that methodology? Sure. A target trial emulation is a um, method for comparative effectiveness research, which has been made popular by Ernan and Robbins um, over the last several years. Uh, these are both epidemiologists that we work with at the Harvard School of Public Health. And they have um, noted that uh, in observational comparative effectiveness research, we're often trying to emulate or to duplicate a trial, a target trial. And they've uh, made uh, uh, suggestions for how to make very explicit the conditions for the target trial. What is the population? What are the contrasts? What is the beginning of follow-up or time zero? What is the outcome? How does one think about balancing the baseline characteristics of people in different exposure groups? And through this target trial em emulation methodology, it, it creates a um, requirement of the analysts, of the investigators, to be much more explicit and a priori in their, in their assumptions. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask about in the methods was that um, you compared obviously people who had their denosumab injections delayed to those who would not had them delayed. Um, can I ask for what reasons were these injections delayed in the first place? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question and it's one that I, uh, we don't have great insights on based from the database that we were able to use. Um, we know as clinicians that many patients don't have their, uh, much of their medical care on time. And that's because of a variety of issues, including um, syst systems issues where there's problems because um, there must be a delay uh, based on the clinic situation or perhaps based on patient factors, patient non-adherence, or patients needing a delay, or perhaps the lack of availability of a uh, open slot for a denosumab injection. So through typical clinical practice, delays are common. But in this specific study, we are unable to um, delineate exactly why people have uh, delays in the den denosumab injection. However, as a clinician myself, I can say that this happens for happens commonly, and it happens for a variety of reasons that often cannot be uh, avoided. And I suppose actually in the current context of uh, coronavirus, um, perhaps it's a very relevant um, study to have done um, going forward. I, I assume obviously the results predate coronavirus, but... Um, yes, yes. I, I, I mean, as a clinician, I can tell you that one of the urgent visits that I've had during the last two to three months of the pandemic has been denosumab injections. Patients calling me to say, I don't want to delay my injection. <laughs> I know it's supposed to happen around six months. 
Yeah. And so these are the patients that we're actually seeing in clinic uh, using proper protective equipment. And they're coming in and getting their injections because of the importance of trying to deliver these injections on time. Yeah, as we've seen from your results. Um, so going to the vertebral fractures now, um, these are notoriously difficult to define. Um, so can you please just explain a bit more about how they were defined in this data set and perhaps whether there was any implications for the conclusions? Yeah, so um, Minnie, you know better than I, read codes are what's used um, in a primary care practice throughout the UK. Read codes are um, diagnosis codes. And the good news is, is that we studied a variety of fractures, in, including vertebral fractures, and um, read codes have actually been studied to see how accurate they are in finding vertebral fractures. And they have a high positive predictive value, which means that when someone is coded to have had a vertebral fracture, they're very likely to have had a vertebral fracture. However, when someone is not coded for a vertebral fracture, it's possible that they had a vertebral, a vertebral fracture, but the coding is just not sensitive enough because um, in, in truth, patients don't always present with every back pain, and therefore um, we're probably missing vertebral fractures in both or in all three groups, the, the, the group of patients where there was no delay, short delay, and more severe delays. So you're absolutely right that these may not be perfectly accurate, but they're uh, very specific codes. So when someone has been coded to have a vertebral fracture, or any of the other fractures, they're a very high probability that they actually did have those fractures. Fine, okay, thank you. Um, and then going to the results. Um, so I noticed from the results that the risk of vertebral fractures was um, almost four times higher in those who had a delayed injection by six weeks, 16 weeks, sorry. Um, it's quite a large effect size. Um, how do you, do you, are there any implications for patient education? based on this, for example? Yeah, I, I think the, um, there clearly are implications for patient and practitioner education. I think that having a, um, a clinic, a physician's practice that works well, understands the importance of delivering denosumab injections on time, or at least avoiding um, a long delay. I mean, again, our data suggests that any delay is bad, short delay is not as bad as a, a long delay. So a four month delay, a 16 week delay is really pretty catastrophic with respect to the risk of vertebral fractures. Yeah. Um, so this really speaks to the importance of having a system in place in a practice for setting these up on time, for calling patients uh, to, to remind them to come in for these appointments, and then for letting patients know Whenever I prescribe denosumab, I let my patients know that if, if you're not getting it on time, it could be worse than not getting it at all. Meaning if we're gonna start this drug, we're gonna to have to keep delivering it on time. And, and patients really seem to understand that once it's explained carefully that the risk of fractures can be two to fourfold higher for specific types of fractures based on how long the delay is. So I absolutely agree with you that a lot of the responsibility has to be put on the patient. However, as, as clinicians, as practitioners, we need to have our practices working well enough to have these delivered on time. Yeah, okay. Um, and then moving to hip fractures. So um, hip fractures notoriously have quite a high mortality rate in the UK. I'm sure they do elsewhere, including in the US. Um, so do these results have any, well, did you find any changes in mortality due to delayed denosumab injections? Yeah, no, it's, you're absolutely right that hip fractures are morbid and mortal. Uh, you know, 50% of patients lose their independence and end up in a nursing home in the US after a hip fracture. And 25% of patients who experience a hip fracture will die during the subsequent year. Now, clearly that's not just about the hip fracture, but that's about the existing comorbidities that patients who develop hip fractures have at the time of their hip fracture. But it's absolutely true that hip fractures are morbid and mortal. We did not study the outcomes of the fractures, such as hip fracture and death, 
in this study. But as you can see from the results, there was a doubling of the risk of hip fracture in the long delay, the greater than 16 week delay. And so again, one might anticipate that with a doubling of the risk of hip fracture, that there's gonna be an increase in the risk of mortality. And so anything we can do again to deliver these injections on time through education of the patient, through developing better systems of care within our practices is important. Okay. And speaking of comorbidities, um, so just taking uh, calcium and vitamin D as an example, um, did you find that those influenced risk at all? No, th those, um, we really um, have limited ability to study calcium and vitamin D as okay. supplements. Some of them are taken over the counter, some of them are prescribed. So I, I really, I, I don't think our study can comment specifically on that. However, I think as you know, all of the studies of pharmacologic agents for osteoporosis, such as the trials with denosumab, always use concurrent calcium and vitamin D. And so sufficient repletion of calcium and vitamin D is critical in patients who are taking pharmacologic treatments for osteoporosis. Um, and we would anticipate that the effects of these agents would be somewhat diminished um, when patients aren't receiving calcium and vitamin D, but our study did not specifically examine that. Fine, okay. Um, and just finally, um, looking at the overall risks, um, did you find that this uh, increased risk um, was above and beyond the baseline risk that you'd normally see um, in this group? So that's, it's, uh, if I interpret your question correctly, <laughs> When you say the baseline risk, do you mean the baseline risk without any denosumab or the baseline risk on denosumab? Um, on denosumab. On denosumab. Yeah. So, so again, on denosumab, if you delay the denosumab, your risk of any fracture, a composite fracture outcome or specific fractures does go up. I think the more difficult question to answer is, is taking denosumab, even if it's delayed, better than taking no denosumab. Mm. And, and, and that's kind of an interesting clinical and, and, and policy question. And I believe that, again, short delay is probably better than not taking it at all. But severe delay, long delay, greater than four months, may actually put you back at the same level of risk as someone who's never begun denosumab at all. Fine. Okay, thank you. Um, and just finally, do you plan to take this work any further in any future directions? Um, and do you have any related abstracts in ULA this year um, relating to this work as well? Yeah, no, we, 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 we don't have any related abstracts um, in this year's ULA, but clearly this kind of work um, is um, really um, along the general theme of sequencing of osteoporosis drugs and making sure that when we use the osteoporosis drugs, we're using them most effectively. And um, you know, non-adherence has been a major issue with all the osteoporosis medications. I began studying non-adherence with oral bisphosphonates 15 years ago and found only 50% of patients were taking these drugs one year later. And so the advent of drugs like denosumab or zolanjonic acid is, is important because the, um, the administration is less frequent. So I think that the efficient and effective use of these drugs in clinical practice through reminder systems, through in, uh, systems that reduce non-adherence is really a implementation science question that we will pursue with respect to denosumab. How can we make sure that denosumab administrations occur on time. And that's, and that's work that we've been thinking about how to pursue and, and we'll plan on some studies in the near future. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was a um, great discussion. Thank you for going, going through all of that with me. Um, so if you'd like to read more about um, Professor Solomon's work, which we've just discussed, um, it will be available, it is available in the e-Congress on the osteoporosis poster tour. Um, thank you very much for speaking with me, Professor Solomon. Thank you.